All right, let's take a little example, and this is surprisingly complex, even though it's very, very little. All right. Here's the graph. And I ask, is that a comparability graph? Yes or no? So let's run our algorithm on this graph. Pick an unoriented edge. Well, there's bunches of them. Pick one. Top left. Top left, he says. Up or down? Down. Down. OK? Now, I'm going to stop right here. You draw that graph on your notes with that starting point, and tell me all the forces that that choice makes. Does anybody see a force? Any force? Are there any P3s up here at all? You're saying yes? Do you see one? Uh, left side. So this one, this one, and this one? OK, that's a P3 because that's not an edge. So that determines a direction on this edge. Okay, so I'll put it on there. All right. Any more forces? No. Check your work thus far. Do you have a conflict? No. So you're back to the initialization stage. Choose any unoriented edge. Pick one. Bottom right hand side, he says. Now, up or down? Down, he says. What does that force? That one P3. So it forces a direction on that edge. Which direction, up or down? Up. Okay. In blue, am I forced to do anything else? No. Stop and check your work. Do you have a conflict in blue? I don't have to look back at the red. I know the red is okay. I mean, yes, red. L look at the blue. Is there any conflict in blue? No. So continue. Pick any unoriented edge. There's only one. Choose a direction for it. Your choice. Left to right or right to left? Doesn't matter. I'll do right to left. Voila! There is a transitive orientation of the graph witnessing that the graph is a comparability graph. The number of loops that you have to go through, sometimes it can be hundreds, thousands, depending on the size of the graph. But that's the method. Choose an unoriented edge. Pick one. Put a direction on it. Spawn out from that the forces using the V rule, the P3 rule. Now, when you do those forces, you might get a conflict. And if you get a conflict, then the answer is no. 
and you show those forces and the conflict as a certificate for your no answer. If you get no conflicts and now all the edges are oriented, you're done and you have the certificate that the graph is a comparability graph. If you have some unoriented edges, you're back to the initialization step, you pick any edge which is not yet oriented and assign it a direction, an arbitrary choice. And you continue until one of two things happens. All edges are oriented with no conflicts, which supports a yes answer, or you get a conflict which supports a no answer. So there was a question back here. How is the conflict? I'm so, say, it, say it a little louder. The middle edge was directed from left to right. No. So how? we have to follow the transitivity. Where, where am I violating transitivity? So the, the far right edge is directed towards the far right, far left edge. So, like, so there are two edges that are directed toward, toward the bottom edge and the bottom edge up toward the far left edge. So shouldn't it be directed from right to left? Excellent. Excellent point. You see the point that she's making? We made this choice in blue and we made this choice in red. So because we made that choice, that dictates the choice for this edge. That dictates that this edge has to go this way. So on the notion of forcing, when you get to an unoriented edge, you can use your transitivity to close up the forces. So the point is that directions are forced by prior decisions. So if you get to the point where there are no forces, then you get a free choice. But you're absolutely right, the choice at that moment was not free. Question? Uh, isn't it also the case that the choice, um, the two blue ones on the right are also not free because if they had been opposite, uh, they would have been incorrect because there's a line uh, joining them. So like if they had been facing so let's see, you're saying that they had to be as drawn and they couldn't be this way? Yeah. Explain to me, oops, I left out a line. Because of that line, there has to be something that forces like, that line to exist. Yeah. And there currently isn't. Well, make your favorite choice. What's your favorite choice? What's wrong with that? OK. Now, this is a very little example. But let me show you the posets that we're talking about. The posets are this this and this. All three of those posets can have the same comparability graph. If I label it A, B, C, and D, a, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D. Are there any more posets which have the same comparability graph as those three? Question, are there any more posets which have the same comparability graph as those three? Yes, no? 
What about this picture right here? I label the one in the middle as C and the one on the top as D. What happens if you interchange those labels? Changes the POSET. Does it change the comparability graph? Changes the POSET. Does it change the comparability graph? Yes, no? Yes, it changes the comparability graph? No, no, comparability graph is just the graph. It has no direction. It would change the label on comparability. It would change the label on comparability graph. <coughs> Doesn't even do that. Doesn't even do that. All of those guys have A, B, C, D as their comparability graph. If I, if, I, if I want to emphasize that it's a graph, draw it like this. No, no directions. A and B, C and D. All of those guys have that graph as their comparability graph. And you can interchange C and D. You can interchange C and D. You can turn this one over. So there's more. There's a whole bunch of them. Simple look. Four, four elements, but there's lots. Okay. okay. But this is an efficient process. You can teach a computer to do it. You can teach a computer to recognize P3s because, naively, you just pick up the vertices three at a time. It's a for i equals 1 to n, for j equals i plus 1 to n. So now you have i, j, and k. You have the three vertices, and you check to see whether or not it's a P3. And there's six different ways that that can happen. And for each one, you say, is a, this edge oriented if it forms a P3? And then you, you have the notion of a force. So with a loop, a du it's a double loop. You can implement the P3 rule. Okay. So you can check transitivity. You look at all your, your triples. And do you have a direction on IJ? Do you have a direction on JK? And if you do, and they go in the same direction, then you must also have a direction on IK. So quickly implementable. You can run this. Because it's, it's big O of n cubed, you can run this say, up to n equals 500 without much trouble. 500 cubed, most computers can handle 500 cubed. The way we've done it, you probably couldn't do it with n being 50,000. 50,000 cubed is a pretty big number. But by hand, you can do this. You know, up to 20 quickly. OK? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let's do another one. You tell me whether or not. Question. Oh, question, yes? Bring the left hand. The graph all the way to the right, is that correct? This one? Yeah. You tell me. No. I'd say it's not. Where, is that, where does that go wrong? You would have to have a line from the point all the way on the right to the point on the top. Because you're saying that those are comparable. Where? If you label them A, B, and C, I'll, I'll try to elaborate. A, B, and C? Where are I? on the other one. D, D, what, what? You're saying that A is less than D, and D is less than B, so therefore B must be uh, greater than A. It is. A is less than B. Okay. So that is correct, then. Yeah. This is OK. OK? Are you with me? Yes. Better? Okay, good. <laughs> 